Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back. Julie Add is joining us here. The owner of Ketamine is Hope, and it really is for so many people. Based out of South Bend, Indiana, she's here to talk more about her IV therapy clinic, uh, which provides the ketamine IV for treatment-resistant depression, PTSD, uh, OCD, PPD, anxiety, suicidal adulation, and so much more. Welcome back to the show today, Julie. How are you? How's your week? Uh, going well, thank you. Can't wait for the Labor Day weekend, though. We get an extra day, uh, right? <laughs> How's everything? I know. It'll be nice. Aww. It'll be nice. Good. We're going to head up north to Michigan for a few days just to kind of relax. So it'll be nice. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, a pleasure to have you back here. And for those new time listeners not familiar with who you are, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. And I know we're going to have a great conversation just like last week. Sure. So my name is Julie Addis, and I am an advanced practice nurse, uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist. I've been doing that for 25 years, and I opened up Cadet Oak here in South Bend, Indiana in November of 2023. After just, uh, you know, researching in and really seeing a lot of patients struggling, um, you know, really throughout the United States with different things that um, traditional medications aren't working for, so... We have been open since November, and, um, yeah, we've had some really good success. Great. Well, uh, we had, you know, last week on some uh, amazing patients of yours and the testimonials of the help they've received uh, from you and obviously how they're, you know, huge fans of this. They tried other ways to quit uh, addictions and uh, things they're resistant to, and they really commend you on your work. And I know today we're going to have another client call in uh, in particular. Would you mind just sharing a little bit of their background and what we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, um, today, you know how last week we kind of um, touched more on uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and addiction. Today, um, you know, I was just kind of thinking of some of my clients with very high anxiety, um, depression, and some suicidal thoughts. So the patient that... Um, uh, is going to be calling in today is a lady who really struggled, struggled with anxiety. Um, she was on some clonopin and was unable to get off of that because her anxiety was so high. And, um, yeah, she's just really a breath of fresh air. Like, And I just think back to the first time she came, um, she didn't want really to do her intake forms online, which is fine. Mm-hmm. I, gave her, I gave her some to sign, and she was so nervous that she was almost unable even to hold a pen. And then fast forward, she has been able to wean herself off of the clonopin, and she rates her anxiety very, very low, and her depression very, very low. Okay. And one thing I wanted to, I don't remember if I really touched on this or not, but when the patients um, come to our clinic and are into our system, we have an uh, electronic health record called OzMind, which really focuses a lot on um, ketamine therapy. So I can send surveys to patients to see how they're progressing. And then a lot of times, even after, after they've done their first six, sometimes I'll just send them one here and there just to check in on them, see how they're doing. But, of course, we want to see that downward progression, and hers just was um, phenomenal. So. Aw, well, it's exciting mm-hmm. to hear so many people benefiting from this. And I know um, you've been doing this for quite some time. Could you just share how you uh, figured out, um, you know, all of this? I mean, in your career, uh, all these years, could you share how you discovered, um, you know, this in a sense? Give us a little of your backstory. Um, you know, the first, I always think back to the first time I ever saw somebody. Um, be administered ketamine, and it was a long time ago, but I was an ICU nurse, and, um, you know, like I said, ketamine can be also used for chronic pain, and in high enough doses, we can use it in the operating room as an anesthetic, and um, a patient in the ICU had a very, very bad injury, and with a horrific wound change, and the anesthesia department would come up and give him ketamine, and he would just kind of lay there, and he'd stay stable, he would never, his breathing never changed. And they would do this dressing change on him, and he wouldn't even move. I thought, wow, that's just really an interesting thing. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Like that. You know, and I've just kind of always been curious about it. I mean, it's really, um, you know, in wartime, 
sleep given ketamine, and actually some of the vets that they've given it to have shown a lower um, a lower chance of developing post-traumatic stress disorder and depression afterwards. Curious. I mean, that's kind of interesting a bit. So I just kind of, you know, kind of kept on with that, and then I took a, a class on it online and gone to some conferences, and I I really thought my only failure was if I didn't try. Yeah. You know, what's the worst that could happen? It doesn't work out. Hey, at least I tried. And so. it did not fail. You've been helping. The no, it has not failed. See? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's always, and there's always outliers, too. Like, yeah, I think we've talked about before. You know, I try to talk to the patients about really realistic expectations. I mean, you're not going to wake up and be a brand new person. And I can be a totally different person. So what is success for some people? What equals success? I mean, some people will say, hey, getting out of bed. Yeah. Going to get a job. Yeah. You know, everybody has a different meaning of success. So I kind of like to talk through that with them beforehand so that, you know, I don't want people to think they're going to turn into somebody completely different. Mm-hmm. Nope. Well, you also have over 35 years working in the healthcare industry as a, you're, is it a certified registered nurse? I'm a certified registered nurse and nurse for 25 years. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're a researcher with ketamine therapy. You saw people in the facilities you were working at, right? And saw how it was helping them. That was, the, that was how you first discovered it? Well, like I said, I always kind of remember that one moment. But, I mean, that was really more for pain and anesthetic-wise. And then I was just so perplexed at the drug itself and how well it worked and how safe it was. I mean, the patients don't experience respiratory distress or anything like that. That's why it is so safe in the operating room, you know, things like that. Well, here we are talking about ketamine infusions, and let's talk about some of the benefits. I know we talked a lot about anxiety, depression. What about, um, you know, women going through postpartum? And, uh, you know, after you have that baby, there's a lot that happens with uh, women. And yeah. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, there was a statistic that I just uh, heard last week that, like, one in four women are on an antidepressant. Uh-huh. So... You know, along with other things, you know, probably hormonal shifts can cause some of that too. But um, yeah, we've had a lot of lot of women that have benefited from the ketamine infusions for depression and um, postpartum depression, especially because it just you know works on a different receptor than typical. Um, Prozac capsule, those types of medicines, which for you know for some people they work great. Yeah. But there's always the outliers, right? Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask, you know, when it comes to something like that, obviously you make sure that they have their, do they need doctor approval before they come to you, or do they need to bring their medical records? How do you know someone's suffering from this where you can offer the, the infusion therapy for someone? Mm-hmm. Yes, I do ask them to um, have a referral either from a therapist or the primary care or somebody who is prescribing their medicines and has diagnosed them. And I ask everybody, all the patients, too, if they've discussed it with their physician that they're going to be coming here. So there's a few, a few conditions that um, I would probably want a little bit more in-depth um, assessment on. And those would be patients with, you know, significant heart disease, um, maybe having psychotic type of effects or possibly a schizophrenia, those things. But short of that, there's not a lot of outliers that cannot come. Mm-hmm. So. Well, also, let's talk about um, those that we didn't really touch too much upon, those suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Is that is that strictly for those that have served, uh, you know, as a veteran, or does PTSD stand for something else as well, not for just those that have served? It could be any type of no, stress also, factor. Yeah, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, we think about it a lot as for the vets, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it can be everybody. And, and it's people that can experience trauma 
and do okay with it. But then there's some patients that just really cannot get past it. And they almost, it's just, it keeps like rebooting in their brain constantly. You know, and everybody has um, their own determination of what a traumatic event is. Mm-hmm. It could oh. be uh, anything, right? I mean, even at work, is, could uh, losing a job be PTSD? I mean, could that be traumatic for someone? Well, sure. And then if it, you know, trickles down into, you know, there's financial concerns. There's, it, you know, goes into the home, not able to afford things. It trickles down that way. Got it. We have a caller calling in. Hello. Welcome to the show. You are live on the line. Who's this? Hi. Hi, who's this? This is Suzette Clayton. Hi, Suzette. It's a little hard to hear you. Hold on. Could you get closer to the, the, the phone? I don't know if you're on it's speaker or... No, I'm, I'm just talking into my phone. Okay, okay. Sorry, there. sorry. We, we hear you. There you are. No, Hi. Okay. So nice to meet you. You are alive on the line, obviously. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. And we're here with Julie Addis. Uh, Julie, do you want to do a little overview of your uh, patient? Yeah. First of all, Suzette, thank you so much for calling in because, um, sure. yeah, as I was looking through my list, I'm like, she is just like one of the bright lights. I feel like it's our little family here. Aww. Seriously. Um, but yeah, I told you a little bit, Suzette, that, um, boy, I think back to the first time you came to now. And it just seems like your anxiety really has lessened so much, so... I kind of wanted to talk about that and just really, um, yeah, just kind of share how you feel and how it, how it made you feel getting this, okay. getting this idea. Um, yeah, I have to admit that I was pretty terrified about the whole thing. It was something totally unknown to me, and I didn't know anyone who had uh, gone through the experience until about, I think, six months before... I started, okay. and they were just showing such great changes that I'm like, you need to get over your fears and give it a shot, yeah. and um, I'm really glad that I did. It has helped me tremendously with my anxiety and PTSD. Um, I was fearful the first time, and I had my psychologist with me because I wasn't sure what was going to uh, happen. So it was nice to have that extra little bit of safety net. And um, upon completing the six sessions, I can say I felt there was a tremendous difference in my way of interacting with the world and people. Um, I don't know how much more you want me to go on with. And so now I'm just doing the booster once a month. I was just going to ask. So how many times did you did you actually uh, see Julie for the for the treatment? How many? I did the six initial treatments, and then there was one in July as well as August. Wow. And did you notice the change in how you felt immediately after the first, or did it take one or two or three to start the to feeling better? Um, I think there was definitely a change with the first one. The second one was more pronounced, and the third one was actually quite giddy. <laughs> I, would, I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't seem to stop enjoying every part of the day and the people I was meeting, and it was so wonderful to not have all these filters and boundaries and protections, and I just was able to interact in such a freer way than I had in the uh, the past. Wow. And mm-hmm. could I ask what you tried before this? Did you try any other treatments? I had. I had had great success with brain optimization. Um, and it seemed that after my husband passed away, uh, I just couldn't seem to get that groove back. And so I had been struggling for the four years since that had occurred. Um, and I have done a great deal of EMDR since 2003, um, and it has helped me tremendously to move forward and take control of my life. Aww. Beautiful. 
Well, all, you. you're I welcome. Like it. <laughs> well, you sound happy. This is great. And I am. what was your hesitation before? What did you know? How did you discover this as an option? You know, and how did you meet Julie? Um, there was a group of people, and we were talking, and a few of them had tried it and had visible and concrete results. And I was wanting those results for myself. Um, my fears from things that I was told back in the 60s that doing something like this, everything in your brain goes up in the air and it comes down rearranged. And that just like, what if it doesn't come back down? Kind of fear, which was totally silly. Um, so I had all these preconceptions being back to when in the late 60s, 70s, when people were tripping out and such. So they obviously were not well-founded. And this is a very controlled, supervised, regulated experience. You're not controlled. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as far as recommending Julie, what would you say about her as, uh, you know, your provider and how she explained everything and handled everything to you? Would you recommend her to your friends? Absolutely. And I have. Aww. I have. I actually was talking about Julie with the anesthesiologist when I had a procedure, outpatient procedure done a month or so ago, and he was very interested I talked to my brother-in-law about it, and he's interested. You know, um, that's about it right now as far as people I have shared. My sister, because she lives in another state far, far away. So. Aww. I will if this subject comes up. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Susan. Susan, you need to tell her a little bit about, um, tell her about the clonopin that you used to take. Um. I have been I on Clonopin. Could you repeat that, please? No, I just find well, it fascinating how it was able to help you get off it. Okay. Um, I started taking Clonopin when I was diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, my tremors and patterning and behavior was such as the oncologist that I cannot do the chemo and radiation with you in the state that you are in. And I was on, I don't remember what I was on. And so he recommended that I try Klonopin, and that just worked great. It was wonderful. But it's, I don't believe Klonopin is something that you want to be on long term. And so one of my goals in doing the ketamine was find a way to get myself off of uh, the Klonopin, which I've been off almost all month now. So... I'm still tweaking things a bit, and there are some rougher, rougher days than others. Yeah. But in general, I have a lot of tools in my toolkit right now to bring anxiety down. And I think the basis of the ketamine treatment allows me to do that on my own, like resetting the vagus nerve. Uh, my meditations are stronger now. Um, and that is, both of those have helped. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Julie, did you want to ask her anything else about the process, about <laughs> how she, of course, would recommend you to anyone? <laughs> no. I would ask recommend Julie to anyone. Aww. And I would, don't be afraid. Be ready for a marvelous adventure to your true self. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for calling in and for sharing this and wishing well, you the best welcome. along your journey and uh, feeling better. <laughs> Thanks to Julie. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. You have Bye a fantastic now. day. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Aw. Always You're good welcome. to hear positive stories like that. And uh, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty mm -hmm. more where they came from, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, there was, there was actually a, another another patient, you know, just uh, talk about the really high anxiety. I and mean, there's some, anxiety is just really taking a upward climb, it seems like, on some patients. But, yeah, I had a, a similar lady come in, and she was much more anxious than the caller that just called in. Um, I, really, I really wasn't even sure we were going to be able to get an IV in her. Wow. So even nervous of that. Yeah. Yeah. I finally said to her, I said, you know, 
I don't want you to feel like you don't have, you don't want, if you don't want to go, you can go. You don't have to be here, you know. And she said, no, I don't have an alternative. Mm. So, interestingly, after her third infusion, and she was somebody who read a lot, too. Mm -hmm. So, after her third infusion, she said, everything I saw during my infusion time was green. People were green. Houses were green. Everything was green. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. She said, well, it has to symbolize something. She goes, I'm going to go research it. Okay. So she researched it, and she did a couple articles that showed if that's what you see, it means regrowth. That was after her third infusion. I had been fast forward. I had two other patients, Mm -hmm. honestly, right after the third infusion that both saw green. Oh. It's just so interesting. All this stuff just is so amazing to me. Gosh, wow. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. You know, in our last few minutes together, uh, we have uh, five minutes left in the show. Did you want to share another client or two experience? Or what else do you want your listeners to know about why ketamine is hope and why it could be so helpful and help them and whatever they're struggling with? You know, and like with uh, the co- what Suzette said is so true. And, you know, we see mm-hmm. patients that you know their first, their first getting here is your is going to be your hardest yeah. obstacle. You know, and you know, you, the first time here, you don't know me, you don't know our facility, you haven't experienced this before. But if people can just, you know, like kind of get over that and. And, and try something. What's the, worst, what's the worst that could happen if you try it? Mm-hmm. Right? If you've tried other things for many years and it doesn't work, it's like the old analogy, you know, you can go down the same road that has the pothole in it, or you can take a different route. So true. It's so right? true. So, so, so what do you got to lose? You give it a try. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know? But... Mm-hmm. 75 to 80% of the people it's going to work for. And that's a that's much what higher I was number. going to ask about statistics. Like, how, what yeah. are statistics of this, you know, of working? Yeah, I mean, currently the statistics are 75 to 80%. That's pretty, you know, that's a, that's a good statistic when you look at some of the other things that are going on. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't um, discourage if a patient, you know, if patients are on medications, that's fine. My I guess maybe I'm just kind of old school. I graduated from nursing school 30, you know, 35 years ago. And at that time, patients weren't on four, five, six, yeah, different kind of medications. They just, they just weren't. And I just have to think that all that mixture together, and I don't, I mean, how much can our body metabolize? Yeah. Yeah. And what's really working? Are, are you treating a side effect or are you actually treating a symptom? So true. Well, I love... Oh, I'm oh go ahead. Having, you know, med- mm-hmm. I'll say it again. I'm sorry. We stepped on each other. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, you're fine. I mean, I'm not opposed to a, a patient being on an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication. It's just this whole long list of medications that it just seems like it's endless for some people and I just I don't know I, I just really don't think it, it works metabolically but maybe I'm wrong <laughs> that's, that's my thought on it yeah alright well thank you for being here would you mind sharing how we can contact you absolutely you can go to ketamineishope.com there's a contact icon on there if you're a provider there's a referral one on there you can email at ketamineishope.com or you can call and text the office, 574-544-2283. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we will speak again. Are we back on next week? We're all back on next week. Yay. All right, good. Uh, looking forward to it. Hope you have a fantastic Labor Day weekend. And, yes, uh, too. Good. Well, we'll get started and we'll have another fresh show next week. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Joe. All right, have a great day. To all of our listeners, please stay tuned. We'll be right back with more. Don't go anywhere. (laughs) 
Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by End Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.